welcome to Edison Open House Space 2022. In this session, we're highlighting Minaric. It's a manufacturer of laser communication equipment for airborne and spaceborne communication networks, so-called constellations. And with me is their C-3PO, Sven Meyer Brunswick. Sven, C-3PO, hello. <laughs> hello, Vivian. Thanks for having us. Now, we're seeing a complete change in the way in which commercial satellites are being used for global communication. Give us a bit of background to that and what's happening now and, and why is it happening now? Yeah, yeah, that's right. And we, we, we see, I mean, the biggest part is that we're seeing a big shift from large monolithic systems in geostationary orbits, so very few satellites that are very large and very expensive to bring them up there, to the change or to the uh, proliferation of, as you uh, uh, framed it already, constellations, so networks of hundreds and thousands of satellites that are working sort of in unison to provide uh, a joint service. Um, and you can think of this as really large cell phone towers. We used to have like extremely tall cell phone towers in geostationary orbit, satellites that are static uh, with respect to the position on the Earth. And now we tend to have uh, smaller virtual cell phone towers that are some 500, maybe 1,000 kilometers tall, beaming broadband from, from these orbits um, down to the ground. And these satellites, because they're produced now at scale, not as singular individual systems anymore, they're industrialized. So we see serial production capabilities coming up across the industry. Um, and we really see this, this push from the commercial domain because they, they find that they can provide uh, more efficiently broadband services from low Earth orbit than they could do from geostationary orbit because they can reuse or they can use their spectrum that's allocated to them more efficiently. Now, I know you're not the only player in this market. Who are the big players and the big companies that are putting up networks? So we are, we are a supplier for, for, for many of the companies that are out there, right? And the commercial domain uh, I mean, it's many of the known names. Uh, just a few weeks ago, we saw uh, Amazon Kuiper announcing the biggest launch contract in the history of spaceflight, um, or multiple contracts, actually. Um, so Amazon is launching a large constellation of some thousand satellites. SpaceX is already in orbit with a couple of thousand satellites. Uh, OneWeb is in the middle of the launch campaign of the first generation. There's Telesat and others. So these are the broadband providers that are working with networks of satellites to provide internet connectivity on the ground, really for consumers and also industries and government users alike. And then there is also, I mean, something that is not to be um, forgotten, I, I, I believe, is Earth observation satellites. So commercial Earth observation providers that provide uh, images from the ground for different purposes. Um, and they also increasingly interconnect their satellites, um, both with their end users and also just with their own operated satellites to be able to access the data that these satellites are capturing uh, more rapidly. You mentioned governments there. There's also been a seismic shift in the way that governments, which of course used to be the only people or the only organizations that could afford satellites, the way that they're using satellites. Tell me a bit more about that. Yeah, so, so, so on the, the, in the government market, we see, we see lots of the things happening that we've seen happening uh, when the internet was invented. So it's sort of history happening all over again. The, the internet itself was created as DARPANET back then, um, ARPANET actually, by DARPA, um, the US research organization in the Department of Defense, um, to create a resilient communication infrastructure that would withstand an attack on centralized communication network nodes. Now, today, um, space is seen increasingly as a contested domain, and we have seen examples of countries demonstrating anti-satellite weapons over the last couple of years. So what governments, uh, particularly the US government, uh, is really eager to do is to decentralize their communication infrastructure up in space to be resilient uh, against threats um, that are real today. Um, today, uh, just a few rockets would, would be sufficient to blind all communication means that, that are available in times of conflict. Um, now, by creating networks of hundreds of thousands of satellites, um, you're, you're increasing this resiliency, right? So this communication aspect of it is a big one. Um, and then it's just uh, also about the aspect of providing additional services that we do not have today. So um, today, something we're also blind against is hypersonic missiles. Hypersonic missiles cannot be detected by 
conventional satellites that are continuously watching the Earth for the launch of intercontinental ballistic missiles. Um, hypersonic ones are so fast that they need to be detected in quasi real time. Um, and you need to have a new generation of satellites. And these new generation of satellites will live in low Earth orbit and will be highly interconnected. So these two drivers, I'd say, are the most, uh, most important aspects that are driving the government to adopting also this mindset of establishing large numbers of satellites, hundreds, thousands of satellites to do a diverse range of tasks, uh, really. And of course, unfortunately, we wouldn't have heard of hypersonic missiles until six weeks ago when we realized that they're part of modern warfare now. Um, what is the switch from networks containing just a few highly complex satellites to networks deploying hundreds of smaller satellites mean for manufacturers like yourselves? Yeah, so it's, it's a complete industry that is, that is being established as we speak, right? Space industry was never about numbers. Space industry was always about creating few tailored solutions um, and mass production was creating five of the same satellites, right? That, that was crazy numbers back in the days in the space industry. And this thought is being challenged um, uh, um, um, dramatically today with everyone across the supply chain, us, the satellite manufacturers, other providers of critical components for these satellites, everyone is ramping up their production capabilities. And no matter where you look today, um, small companies, big companies, everyone is creating for the first time in their history, um, serial production facilities to cope with the demand that is upcoming. And it's just, it's not increasing by a few percentage points every year. It's orders of magnitude change almost every year, right? So we are jumping from tens to hundreds to thousands to potentially tens of thousands of satellites that are being launched every single year uh, over the course of the next couple of years. And, and that's the common mindset you see across the industry and with Manerik. And can I ask a really stupid question here? Is there room? I mean, how long can that expansion continue? Well, for now, there's quite, quite a bit of room. Uh, as for uh, civil aviation, we do need to put systems in place to ensure our, our planes or satellites are not crashing into each other. Um, but space, is there's quite a lot of room up there if you, if you use it smartly, right? So there's, there's no problem in running into, into room issues just now. So tell me the, about the products that you provide and why is their importance growing? Yeah, so, so what we do is optical communication products. These products are used for long distance, very high data rate communication between the satellites. So in order to now network these hundreds and thousands of satellites that we are seeing going forward, um, they all want to, want to work with each other. They don't want to be stupid things, not talking to each other, right? And, and we provide this networking capability to them. So laser communication, um, the technology that we are working with and that we are um, embodying in our products allows our customers to transmit gigabits of data across very long distances, uh, 10,000 kilometers from one satellite to another in a very secure fashion. So the, the data only goes where it needs to go. The, the laser beam, and we use laser beam to transmit the data from A to B, only goes where it needs to go. It's almost like a laser pointer, you could imagine. We point this laser pointer very accurately across very large distances. So very high bandwidth, very secure, very long distance. And one important aspect, particularly in the satellite domain, you do not need to have frequency, radio frequency uh, spectrum allocated to you in order to operate it. You can operate laser communication at your own will uh, because you do not interfere with anyone else's system. Um, so, so that's a big upside. Um, most of our um, commercial customers use this because they can get a lot of more data from A to B um, compared to alternatives. Lots of the governmental customers we are working with or customers we work with in the governmental market, they use this for the secrecy, uh, security aspect of it and for the resiliency aspect of it that I mentioned earlier, when networking all of your satellites, you're not as uh, dependent anymore on the functionality of any individual satellite within this network because you can always replace it with another satellite coming up the horizon. Um, so, so these are the sort of the two, uh, two drivers, I'd say, commercial market, government market. Um, as a summary, I mean, we as a company work with both of these markets, um, commercial market, government market, and laser communication, think of it as the the fiber optic cable equivalent in space. In order to do any kind of network system in space, there's no way around laser communication. And there's no debate anymore in the industry that laser communication is the way to go. The question is now, 
just how quickly can we ramp up and how how quickly are prices falling that whites that adoption is uh, increasing in pace so from everything you've said monarch is very well placed to benefit from these space trends that we're seeing this move towards you know a mass of uh, of satellites these constellations yeah, I, th I think so. And I think there's there's sort of three reasons for that. The, the one I already touched upon. So I think by now there's no debate anymore that optical communications um, is here to stay. Um, this is not an experimental technology anymore. We are seeing very large programs um, uh, deploying this uh, as a very key component as the systems, right? So there's there's no redundancy sort of built around laser communication. You have to have this capability. Everyone, including us, is ramping up production um, of these kind of products. Um, secondly, um, we are quite well placed in the government market, and that is the leading market at the moment. We have uh, uh, signed Northrop Grumman actually as a, uh, or Northrop Grumman has signed us really as their strategic supplier for this kind of technology for whenever they are doing business with the U.S. government. Um, something we're quite proud proud of. Northrop Grumman, of course, one of the most esteemed uh, global defense and aerospace companies there is selecting us as their strategic supplier for such a critical strategic te technology, extremely important. And just a few weeks ago, uh, we saw the, the, the results, uh, first results of this partnership. We received a 36 million US dollar contract in the framework of a very big, important US government program. Um, so it's a very good position there with lead customers. Um, and then lastly, I think we have made steps very early on to lead sort of this industrialization of this technology. And I think that's the, the theme I touched a couple of times upon uh, during the, the conversation today, um, that space is not thinking anymore about let's create unique solutions, but let's create something that can work at scale, right? Let's think about industrialization. Let's think about scalability. This has been at the core of the company Manerex since its foundation. Um, so we are quite strongly positioned there. I think this combination of factors, so um, the, the technology is here to stay, um, the, the company has the right lead customers and the right strategy from the early on, uh, or from the early days of the company really positions us quite well in this market. That sounds like a really exciting future. Uh, Sven Mybrosvik, C3PO of Minaric, thank you so much. Well, thank you, Vivian. <laughs>